Yeah, yeah, very good. All right. So you missed my, uh, never mind. Anyway, so um, uh, thanks for coming uh, so bright and early on a Saturday morning. Uh, the uh, talk this morning is about the politics of vulnerabilities. My name is uh, Scott Blake. I'm a VP of Information Security for Bindview Corporation. And uh, the, uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of um, background here. My, my intent with this talk is not to uh, ex espouse a particular viewpoint about the politics, but rather to have, uh, have a more rigorous discussion about what the factors are that come into play. What are the various components of the politics of vulnerabilities? Who are the actors? Uh, what are the policy initiatives that may be uh, having effects now and in the future? So if you're here for a rant about how software vendors suck or uh, how you know, we shouldn't be disclosing anything, that's not what I'm going to, that's not what I'm going to be doing. Uh, I work for a software vendor, um, so just to keep that in mind for everybody. We also do uh, vulnerability research though, so we're sort of on both sides of the fence here. Anyway, uh, just a quick read out, uh, who has taken a political science course before? Quite a few. Pretty good. Okay. Any political science majors here today? One. All right. Congratulations. <laughs> I myself was a social sciences major as an undergraduate uh, and did uh, sociology in, uh, in uh, graduate school, which is really why I'm qualified to talk to you about information security. <clears throat> So what is politics? Politics is the study of power. Right? Uh, and that is a, a very large topic. Has a, there are a lot of uh, components to that. And uh, <clears throat> the, the, we use a working definition of what power is, which I think is very useful. It's very broad. Uh, but it's essentially the ability to make one do what they would not otherwise do. Fairly straightforward. Okay? Uh, it takes a lot of forms, not just as economic power, social power, cultural power, uh, military power, physical power, all sorts of things that come into that uh, that have different kinds of effects. Sounds like there's a plane going overhead. <laughs> uh, a couple of important terms. I'm going to go very quickly, by the way, over the, the uh, initial section here. Uh, and so we'll get to the, there's a crystal ball section at the end. Uh, where I'll make some, some uh, you know, wild-ass guesses about what I think is going to happen. Uh, and then we can hopefully have some time to discuss those. Uh, so these, just some important terms to keep in mind, because I will use these a couple times during the talk. Uh, what is an actor? Right? Some, it's a, it is an entity which can exercise power. It's not necessarily um, an individual, although it could be an individual. It could be a corporation. It could be a government. It could be any number of... Uh, bodies or, or act, uh, things that act, right? things that do things, things that have agency. Uh, an ideology is a set of beliefs or ideas. That's what we'll, we'll be uh, categorizing certain things into, the, into a set of ideologies here. Uh, and legitimacy and authority are very interesting ideas that, I, that is something to keep in mind while we're, that is an airplane. <laughs> uh, while we're going, I love, by the way, I just love this venue. It's the most interesting place I've ever given a talk in in a tent on the roof of a hotel. That's, that's great. Okay. Um, this, I'm sure, is something that everything, everyone here is quite familiar with. But it's important to remember that not everyone agrees on what a vulnerability is. Uh, there are uh, academic, academicians who will generally define a vulnerability as a flaw in software. So for example, if you have a blank root password, they would not consider that to be a vulnerability. The software is doing what it should be doing. It is behaving as it was designed to behave. There is no bug which is producing something there. You could make a case that the ability to set a blank root password is a vulnerability, uh, if the, but only if the software uh, is intended to prevent that, but you are able to subvert that intent through some other means. <clears throat> uh, we use a, a more broad definition here, uh, including misconfiguration. So in our case, the, uh, the blank root password would be considered a vulnerability because of the potential for misuse there uh, that should be fairly obvious for everyone. Okay. So these are the ideologies that I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> and I'll go into a little detail on each of these. Uh, full disclosure. Uh, has a couple of basic ideas that are that are behind it. One of the uh, the foundational ideas uh, is that information should really be free. That it wants to be free. That we want to share information as broadly as possible for the greatest public good possible. Uh, and that that's that's a good thing in and of itself. Is there's, there's a moral good associated with that. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, and also, the full disclosure is a, a power, a use of power associated with it, which is essentially to capture the power of public opinion in order to cause security to improve. That is generally, for those who advocate full disclosure, what they're after. They, the critics of full disclosure often take the point of view that, uh, that, the, that what is going on here is really uh, causing security to be less good than it would otherwise be. Uh, but it, that's not part of the intent, and it's important to, to keep that in mind. <clears throat> uh, most full disclosure includes the release of exploit code. And by the way, these, these terms that I'm using for the various ideologies, are uh, uh, they're debatable, right? And they're loaded. Uh, they're, there are reasons that people pick the certain words that they use to describe certain things because they produce an effect. Uh, and that is essentially a use of power to decide which, you, which term to use and to try to capture certain terms for the for one's own use, rather than letting somebody else use them for something that you may not want them to use want them to use it for. Right? Uh, and but I'm not going to go into that particularly. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the we're just going to sort of take these as a given, uh, as a as categories. But you can call it something else. Uh, you don't have to call it the, the things that I call it here. Okay? Uh, most of the adherents of full disclosure are generally nonprofit researchers. I'll talk about these. Uh, in a little bit of more detail shortly, and a few, but very few, uh, commercial researchers also adhere to that, and that's pretty much it. Mostly it's researchers who are on the full disclosure side. The so-called responsible disclosure uh, has uh, been uh, somewhat popularized in the last year, year and a half, two years, uh, and essentially the major distinction between so-called responsible disclosure and uh, so-called full disclosure uh, is essentially the presence or lack of thereof of exploit code. There are also some timing issues there with notification of vendors that we could make, uh, we could talk about, uh, but the exploit code is probably the, the primary thing. <clears throat> Full disclosure adherents generally believe that, that exploit code has a greater good associated with it, that it has utility in being able to test uh, security infrastructures, firewalls, IDSs, etc., uh, and uh, that therefore it is, there is a, a good to be had with having that stuff out there. Responsible disclosure uh, generally recognizes that there is a good there as well, but keeps that, uh, but, but basically says that it is, uh, uh, it is unbalanced by the potential for damage that can be done with exploit code being broadly available uh, to the public, that the bad guys get their hands on it too, and that that outweighs the good that is, that is associated with having it available. <clears throat> Uh, it's also important to remember that, that responsible disclosure adherents generally are also trying to use the power of public opinion to improve security. By making people look bad for not having their security up to snuff, they hope to improve that. And there's actually, uh, historically, uh, quite a bit of, of evidence to suggest that that is, in fact, the case. Uh, there are, there are, uh, the, the past three or four years, have indicated that the that major software vendors have become much more responsive to security vulnerabilities being announced than they had been in the past. I don't think there will be much dispute about that. Uh, and it, the the case is generally made, and I think rightly so, that the result that that is the result of full disclosure and responsible disclosure being used to to uh, cause them to do that to do something that they would not otherwise do using the power of public opinion. Most of the adherents of responsible disclosure are uh, most commercial researchers, uh, and there's, there are a number of categories in there as well, which I'll talk about when I get to the actors, uh, as well as some notable software vendors. Uh, and uh, it's important, I think, for us to give the, the, a little bit of benefit of the doubt there. Uh, we have a tendency to uh, think of the vendors as being fairly strictly motivated by uh, the, their economic interests. And it's actually somewhat more complicated than that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. It's really hot in here <laughs> and really dry. Is it going to get worse? Great. Well, I'm glad to be going early this time. <laughs> Jeff always gives me an early time slot, and usually it pisses me off. But today, I'm actually happy about it. Uh, Anyway, so zero disclosure uh, essentially tries to, to limit the availability of vulnerability information uh, to anybody. That a discoverer of a vulnerability basically takes that to the software vendor and then is done. Right? Or they may assist the software vendor in some way, but that it is then the software vendor's responsibility to issue patches and do whatever they're going to do, whatever that is, whether it's just issue the patch or just do it in the next version or whatever. Uh, the, uh, the zero disclosure ideology 
pardon me, uh, basically says that you, uh, there, is no, there is no public good to be had in the release of vulnerability information. All you do when you do that is to make it easier for people to break the security uh, that in illegitimate ways. Okay. Uh, and the adherents here, by the way, are many software vendors and most government actors. Uh, well, although the uh, uh, Richard Clark's uh, speech at, at Black Hat on Wednesday, notwithstanding, uh, most sections of, of the federal government, at least, uh, generally think that there is not much good to be had in the release of vulnerability information, as I'm sure most of us are aware. Uh, and the public, this is something that we can discuss in the question and answers at the end. If I have time, I'm going to try to keep my pace up here. Uh, there's, a, there's some debate about this, but the, uh, I basically take the point of view that uh, for people who think that their computer is essentially magic, uh, which is the majority of the public, uh, that uh, they don't see any need for vulnerability information to be out there. That there, well, they don't see any benefit to that, uh, and you know, we can make the, the, that's probably a relatively unreflected uh, opinion, but I think it, nevertheless it's there. Uh, there's another a variant of zero disclosure, which is sort of somewhere in between zero and, and responsible disclosure, uh, which is essentially I call it limited disclosure. It's with it's disclosing vulnerability information within closed communities that limit the ability of the information to be propagated outward. And the great the, the, the easiest example of that is the ISACs, uh, the information security sharing and analysis centers. There are a number of them organized around uh, vertical industries: the financial services industry, electrical power. There's one forming up on healthcare. There's one for information technology. There's a bold bunch of them. These are um, forming out of, I believe it was Presidential Directive Number 63, several years ago, uh, under, the, under the Clinton administration. And they started seeing the formation of these and the uh, and the real propagation of them. The, uh, the Department of Commerce uh, actually takes a leading role in trying to get these things organized. Uh, and the idea here basically is that uh, again, there is no there is no public good in the sharing of vulnerability information, but that there can be limited good for the sharing of information within these closed communities. So if I'm bank A and I share something with bank B, and we are therefore to get combined more secure than we would otherwise be, that's the, an example of the benefits of limited disclosure. Right? They keep things from being told to the bad guys, uh, but don't necessarily uh, keep it from the good guys. And it's an interesting idea. I'll talk a little bit about some of the pros and cons of those uh, in a little bit. Uh, this, uh, I you guys have on the CD this slide, hopefully, um, it's good for, for reference more than anything else, so it lays out the, the, major, uh, the major divisions between these uh, various ideologies. Okay, so who are the actors? <clears throat> I put it into these uh, sort of five major categories uh, and a uh, controversial category or, or problematic category uh, that I refer to as the underground, and I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that in a minute. So the vendors are pretty much the people that we're all familiar with. I'm mostly talking here about um, uh, commercial commercial software vendors as opposed to sort of open source vendors. Uh, it, it's a it's a very it, it's a more problematic to discuss. Uh, the others, uh, in mostly in terms of uh, the uh, <clears throat> uh, for the financing, because it's not really present there uh, in the same way. Although there's a there, it's more akin. The the software vendors uh, that are open source are generally more akin to researchers in terms of motivations and the factors that go into uh, making them do what they do. Uh, and that'll become clear, I think, in the next slide. So we'll just, for now just consider these the commercial vendors. Uh, and the, the uh, points here on the slide should be fairly obvious, I think, to everybody. Um, one that I'll call your attention to uh, is the, the second bullet under interests, which is limiting the vulnerability of customers. Uh, and that's something that, that we, uh, it's questionable whether that should be broken out as a separate point. You can make the case, I think, that, they're, that, that their only interest in limiting the vulnerability of customers uh, is insofar as that limits their damage to the brand value and allows them to sell more software. Right, that if uh, the there is no uh, negative economic value in the uh, in the in the release of uh, of security vulnerabilities, that they wouldn't really care. Right, that if the that the customer being vulnerable, the customer losing access to private information and all that kind of stuff, uh, is not particularly a motivating factor. Here, I, I actually I give the vendor the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I think that there are uh, there is evidence to suggest that software vendors as a as a whole. Uh, do in fact consider this to be a, a part of their interest, not only in terms of its uh, economic value, but in, in terms of it being a good thing in general. Uh, and that they would probably be 
uh, at least interested in improving the security of their software, even if there was no uh, economic benefit or avoidance of economic loss. Right? Uh, and there are a couple of anecdotes I could tell you about those things, and I'll, if we have time, I'll get to those. If somebody's interested, make, sure, be, uh, make a note to ask me a question at the end about that. Okay. So, researchers. The motivations here are also fairly straightforward, trying to advance the state of the art, building more security, and of course, reputation. There's a, there's a parallel with uh, the corporate desire to build brand and, and, for, and, and to strengthen their brand and limit damage to the brand in the uh, building of recognition and respect of the researchers amongst their peers. And this applies to, to all sorts of them. Uh, there are several subgroups within this that are basically uh, broken down along the lines of the various financing sources that they have. What I referred to earlier as nonprofit researchers uh, are generally either academic or hobbyists. And by hobbyists, I'm referring to people who have a day job, but they're not getting paid to do the research per se. They're getting paid to do something else, but they do this on their own time or they do it as in, uh, not as part of their job description. Okay? Uh, the uh, academic researchers are generally funded by grant, uh, search, uh, grant sources, granting authorities, um, and or contract. Commercial researchers are also funded by contract and by software sales. Uh, there are a number of companies, Bindview included, that are predominantly software sales companies, product companies, but that also maintain uh, security research organizations within them <clears throat> and publish security, vulner uh, security vulnerability information. Uh, there are also others that take money to find these things. Uh, consulting organizations and some other groups uh, take uh, contract work in order to find uh, security vulnerabilities. Somebody comes to them and says, you know, we're thinking about using Firewall X. Uh, is that okay? And they go and they look at it and they you know, see if they can find vulnerabilities in it. And there are some interesting things that have been published from some of those sources, but a lot of that work is actually done under NDA and it never sees the light of day. <clears throat> Uh, the two primary interests on the part of researchers are to continue the funding source. <clears throat> no researcher really wants to jeopardize their ability to uh, pay their rent or their mortgage, as the case may be. Uh, <clears throat> they, uh, and, and so whether that's their day job or the contracting that they're getting from their customers, the software that they're selling to their customers, or the granting authority, whether that's the feds or some other, some other organization, uh, generally the researchers are constrained by uh, that source of funding and will not, and, and will, and will not jeopardize that. Uh, this is actually one of the major reasons that we, had, um, that we have had in the past and continue to have now lots of people uh, who are essentially using their pseudonyms, right? Because they, they are required or, or desire, find it prudent to separate who they really are uh, from what their, uh, their uh, real world identity from their security research. Uh, primarily, that's a, a financial decision that, that has to get made. Not exclusively, but primarily. So these are the, uh, the points here, some of the uh, power relations that we have with researchers and some of the other actors that are involved. I don't need to read them to you. You guys can all read, I assume. Anybody can't read the slides? Now, the underground is, as I mentioned, is something of a problematic subcategory. Okay? Uh, there are a number of ways of defining the, the underground, and the, the points that I've put up here uh, are, are, are sort of somewhat inflammatory uh, as a way of categorizing the underground, particularly in our uh, present company. Uh, however, uh, what I'm doing here is essentially to try to break out uh, what we might refer to as the black hats or the, fo the malicious hackers uh, or the attackers or the crackers or whatever, whatever term you want to put on it. Uh, in this case, I've, I've chosen to put on there uh, the underground. It doesn't have to be that. It could be, it could be something else. Uh, and uh, I'd be happy to, to talk about that afterwards if anyone has any questions about it. But these are important, uh, there are some important differences between other researchers um, and what I'm referring to here as the underground. Uh, and the most important one here actually is that these are generally people who are uh, observers of either zero disclosure or limited disclosure as an ideology as opposed to the rest of researchers who are either full disclosure or responsible disclosure in what they, uh, in what they adhere to. Uh, and the major interest for that is that in, in most cases we're talking about folks who don't want anyone to come spoil their party. They don't want, to fix, don't want the vulnerabilities to be fixed. Improving the security of the software is generally not an interest for the folks that we're talking about here. Okay? 
Uh, and so the funding sources are generally coming from the same places that we've seen in the others. These researchers are people who are coming in the same kinds of places, but there is an important additional piece here, uh, which is crime, criminal activities as, as a funding source for some of these things as well. Uh, and the interest here is basically for uh, the maintenance of vulnerable software. Uh, governments are another category, important category of actors, uh, and their primary motivation is what I refer to as the technocratic perception of public good. Uh, the, there, I think there can be little dispute that the governments are trying to do what they think what they think is best okay, for everybody, uh, and balancing the competing interests of the various constituencies that the governments have. Now, how they arrive at what that is, is a very interesting concept, okay? And those of you who have taken a political science course know uh, that there, we could talk about this particular aspect all day long, at least, if not for an entire semester or longer. Uh, you know, people have written big books about this and, and how governments come to decide what it is that they're trying to do. Um, but it, I think it's just important for us to consider here uh, that the public good is, in fact, what the government is trying to accomplish. Now, we may very well, we, we may and often do disagree with what they think the public good is, uh, but that is nevertheless what they're trying to do. So, <clears throat> uh, there are a couple of uh, points here on uh, financing. Both taxes and campaign contributions are important pieces to consider, at least in our, uh, in our particular form of democracy, such as it is, uh, and some others as well. The, the campaign contribution is an important, uh, important component of funding uh, for the, in deciding of what the activities of the government are going to be. <clears throat> you guys can read through all this stuff. If you have any questions about this, be sure to uh, ask me at the end. Uh, the media is also a very important player in terms of uh, wielding power in the, in the vulnerability thing, the whole disclosure debate, if you will. And what they're trying to do is fairly straightforward. They're trying to get readership. They're trying to maintain their uh, revenue stream and expand their revenue stream coming from either subscribers, people who want to read what they're, what they're printing, and from advertisers. <clears throat> Most media outlets have some mix of these uh, for, their, for their funding sources. Some are very heavily in one than the other, and these produce different effects um, in making the decisions about what news is fit to print um, and what news, what angles the story should be taken. Uh, the financing and the interests of the readers are, are uh, major uh, major components here in how these things work. Power relations are, are essentially straightforward. All of the uh, all vendors want good PR, right? All vendor, all governments want good PR. Most researchers want good PR. Most of us want to have the media say good things about us and make us look smart and cool. Right? Um, and they have the power to do that and decide who gets to look smart and cool uh, <clears throat> uh, and are very strong influencers of public perception. Uh, there's an interesting uh, note there that uh, there's a, a tremendous degree of fear in the general populace. Something like 70% of the American population uh, believes that it is unsafe for them to uh, buy things online. Who's bought something online? Pretty much everybody. Not everybody, but almost everybody. Uh, did you feel safe when you did it? Who, who felt safe when you bought something online? Most, most everybody. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, Mark Loveless, our, our uh, illustrious Razor team member, was pointing out that he bought on his corporate card. So. <laughs> So he didn't care. And you shouldn't care either, actually, if you're using even your own credit card information, because your liability is limited by law at most to $50. And by sort of public trade practices, most uh, credit card companies, unless they think that you really did buy it and you're lying, um, won't even let you give you the 50, bu 50 bucks for, for liability of misuse of your cards. Most of them will give you full, um, full refunds of any, of any uh, you know, not charges that weren't yours. <clears throat> so the question then becomes, you know, what are they afraid of? Whatever the media says they're afraid of, I would submit. But <clears throat> we can talk about that later, too. <laughs> uh, the public here is a, I mention it because it, it's, uh, uh, it's an important component of what we're talking about with the, the <clears throat> various perceptions of public good and people wanting to do what's best for everybody. Um, it's, however, very difficult to talk about the public as an actor. Uh, and I, I've put these two points here, too chaotic to be relevant. <clears throat> 
you can't really talk about any one or even set of motivators that would fit onto PowerPoint slides uh, in any meaningful way. It's just there's just too many of them uh, for it to make sense. There are competing interests that doesn't, and also the public has not act doesn't necessarily act consistently, uh, except insofar as they continue to buy software that sucks, which they do um, at length and with lots of money. So that's uh, uh, an important thing to consider in the vulnerability debate. Okay. So uh, I'm going to go uh, again quickly through some of the policy initiatives that I'm doing pretty well on time, so we should have plenty of time for questions and uh, talking about some of the crystal ball stuff at the end. Uh, okay, so first off is the uh, Council of Europe's Cyber Crime Treaty. The, uh, this was <clears throat> pardon me, passed a couple years ago. Uh, the intent here was to harmonize and update European computer crime laws. Uh, the U.S. actually participated quite extensively in the drafting of this uh, treaty and uh, has actually signed on to it, as have a number of non-European countries. Uh, basically, all the, all the treaty really is is a set of guidelines for what kinds of computer, law, computer crime laws uh, the various countries should adopt. And so they, by signing on, they basically say, yeah, we're going to do that. And it, you can, from a law enforcement point of view, you can see the benefit uh, of being able to know that just because the person who broke into your system is located in Germany or, or uh, the Netherlands, I don't want to pick on anybody in particular, or Switzerland, whatever, uh, they, you can feel, you have fairly, uh, fairly good confidence that you're going to be able to prosecute them under similar, if not the same laws as you have. So it, it makes sense from a, from a law enforcement point of view and from a, from a governing point of view. Uh, one of the key components of, or not one of the key components, but one of the components of the Cybercrime Treaty that is pro uh, highly problematic are the provisions for the criminalization of the possession of so-called hacker tools. Uh, I, is there anyone here who is not in possession of a hacker tool? <laughs> yeah, good question. The question was, what's a, what's a hacker tool? Uh, and that's not defined uh, particularly well. Essentially, uh, what's defined in the treaty as is uh, software that is, uh, and hardware, actually, uh, that is used to subvert the legitimate security measures, the legitimate security mechanisms um, on computer systems and computer networks. Uh, there, is an, it, the, um, there is an important caveat within the treaty, lest anyone get too bent out of shape and go deleting stuff off your hard drives while I'm talking here. Uh, the intent to use them in a malicious fashion is, is a necessary prerequisite for the law. Uh, the, uh, the, the problem here, of course, is that that intent is very difficult to show, uh, and uh, it's very also very difficult uh, to establish that, uh, that the intent was not there if something bad happened. Um, so the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, there is no case law here yet. It'll be interesting to see as it, as it forms up. Uh, but the, this particular provision in, in, as well, I think, will have a, a tendency to, to push us in the direction of uh, certification requirements for security practitioners, insofar as you want to be able to define who has a legitimate interest in possessing and who does not have a legitimate interest in possessing, and who has the, the uh, legitimate authority to perform certain actions like cracking password databases. If you're a security practitioner, the law very specifically says you do have the right, you, do, you are allowed under the law to test the security of your systems by hacking it. Okay. It says that very clearly. Uh, but the question, of course, is who are you and what's your authority in, a, in any particular case and how do you establish that? Uh, the information sharing policies I talked about a little bit earlier of uh, the ISACs, these have been moving, uh, moving along quite, uh, quite well. There are several of them up and running and more are coming along all the time. Uh, the ideas here are basically to get better intelligence within these, or within these communities uh, so that they can have better predictability of the attacks that they may be facing and better idea of what vulnerabilities are likely to be exp uh, tar uh, exploited in their environments. Uh, the, and they want you know, the idea is to help them stay a step ahead of the, the bad guys. Uh, the, the problem with it, of course, is that these or the organizations that are members of ISACs have very little interest in discussing a, in sharing any of their information outside of the ISACs, which is problematic for security research, particularly academic research, which depends upon the free flow of information in order to have so that security researchers can know what is taking place out there and be able to to uh, uh, improve the state of, of security. Uh, the uh, 
these in ISACs have a tendency to keep the information enclosed within them. And it does also uh, propagate that information up to the government, but it very rarely gets outside of those communities, uh, which is uh, highly highly problematic for public discussion, particularly academic research. Uh, and also, it, it, I, what I say is information haves and have nots. People who are in ISACs have access to all of this information, and people who are not in ISACs don't. They have no access to this stuff. They don't know what's going on, and they and they won't know what's going on. Now they. The vision of ISACs, to be fair, is that once these are all up and running, most companies would be part of them. The information will flow up to the government, and the government will then give it back out. Well, the government doesn't really have a great track record on giving it back out. I see a couple of people laughing in the audience, right? Uh, and that's fair. I mean, the, uh, the, one of the major criticisms of, of all of the public-private partnerships, like Nipsey and InfraGuard, is that the private companies give their information to the feds, and nothing ever comes back. Well, you know, the feds are, uh, will defend themselves if there are any present by saying that you know, they're restricted if there are prosecutions, that they have uh, laws that, that deal with what they're allowed to tell other people, and, and that's cool. Uh, but, you know, what's the benefit for us giving them information in the first place? Okay. Uh, the disclosure forums has been a uh, hot topic in the last couple of weeks, uh, at least with uh, one of them anyway. And, uh, but these are, they're an important thing to consider in the, uh, they're, they're an important factor in, all, in putting all of this together. Uh, the, uh, the idea here is, of course, to get information out to everybody who needs it, to everybody who's running a system who wants to know what, the, what security issues are going to be present on their systems. Uh, the, the, the other side of it, of course, is that these are, are open communities. These are open mailing lists. Anybody can get on. And often you have people who, are, who simultaneously have a legitimate interest in the information and are intending to use it for illegitimate purposes. Uh, and that's, uh, that's problematic. The, one of the reasons that we've seen these things grow, I think, and become a major, the major source for information dissemination uh, is that it is really essentially impossible to make the distinction between who the good guys and the bad guys are. Uh, it's the, the, there's no good way to do that, uh, as far as we know, anyway, so far. Uh, and uh, so anyway, it'll be interesting to see, I think, what happens with, uh, with bug track under uh, new management. Uh, the Organization for Internet Safety was uh, announced last November and hasn't really done much uh, in the meantime. The idea here is essentially that this, inf this organization's idea is to promulgate responsible disclosure, to, uh, uh, to help uh, vendors and researchers get together and, and be collegial with each other, to share the information in the ways that are appropriate ahead of time before public disclosure, um, and to uh, make sure that the information that is going out into the public is what the public needs and not too much. They're trying to walk a fine line here, uh, and it's an interesting idea. Uh, the idea being, of course, to limit the about amount of information as opposed to the classification of information that's available to, the, to again, the so-called bad guys. Uh, of course, it, what they're doing is, is by primarily, uh, and I should say we, by the way, Mindview is, is a member of this organization. Uh, what we're doing is, is um, having the, the effect, I think, of limiting the information, again, the, the, the quantity of information more than the, than the quality of information uh, that's available to everybody, not just the, the good guys and the bad guys, but, but everybody. Uh, and uh, I think that there, there is some concern, some legitimate concern about the extent to which it will have a chilling effect on research in general as we start moving forward. The, uh, the polite thing to do, I'm sure, as we all know, with, uh, with uh, uh, vulnerability information is to let the vendor know ahead of time. And that takes time, it takes effort, it costs money uh, in a lot of cases, and uh, not necessarily cash, but time uh, that people, somebody is paying for. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> and it's basically a real pain in the ass. So <coughs> there's a, certainly some extent to which researchers will uh, or may uh, f decide not to do the research or decide not to contact the vendor or even to publicize the vulnerability uh, because of the, uh, the requirements that are placed on them uh, by the kinds of policies that are, that, uh, are going to be advocated by the Organization for Internet Safety. <clears throat> There's been a lot of legislation in the U.S. lately uh, that's come along in the last couple of years. Some of this stuff with the, the FOIA and antitrust exemptions are pending. They aren't. Uh, they are not currently passed. But uh, and actually, the uh, uh, the FOIA thing is actually not. <clears throat> it's being characterized not as an exemption, uh, but as a clarification of the existing provisions within FOIA. There is actually a provision within. The, the idea here is for when private companies and private parties give information to the government about security, about incidents, and about vulnerabilities, uh, that, that, in, that their private information does not then become subject to the Freedom of Information Act uh, and then exposed to the press and exposed to their competitors in ways that they don't want it to be. 
uh, that actually FOIA already has a provision within it uh, that private information that's shared for national security purposes and law enforcement purposes uh, generally does not fall under the free is not is generally not uh, releasable under the Freedom of Information Act, um, and the idea here is to clarify that provision to include networking type information uh, and system type information, uh, so that companies will feel more comfortable uh, giving this stuff out. And also, uh, the antitrust provisions are important for the ISACs, so that they're not open to charges of collusion uh, for these companies that are all operating within the same industry for sharing security information. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, this stuff is somewhat controversial. There's been some press coverage about it. Uh, the, there's, of course, potential for misuse there, uh, that the FOIA provisions might be extended to include things that it wasn't intended to include. And, of course, that the antitrust exemptions as well could be uh, used to uh, allow things that the law is intended to uh, not allow. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how these, how these work themselves out. Uh, I, I would actually predict, given the current environment of uh, uh, corporate reform that we'll probably see both of these pass, uh, particularly also in the in the uh, the, the uh, climate of the of the public regarding uh, security right now, which doesn't show any China sign of changing anytime soon. Uh, legislation has passed the House earlier this year uh, to increase funding for both NIST and NSF uh, for uh, additional research monies to be made available for graduate fellowships and other kinds of uh, research grants for improving security. Uh, the NSA, NIST, and a couple of other organizations are working on a single gold standard. The idea here is to basically, they're doing Windows 2000 first, so they'll add other systems as they go along, is to establish a baseline configuration that's, that's better than the default, uh, that is not necessarily highly secure, but is a, it, but is a lot better than what it was. Right? Uh, they're suggesting that they're going to be able to get perhaps as many as 80% of the vulnerabilities uh, that uh, might be affecting, that are likely to be affecting their systems just with, by establishing this baseline uh, of uh, security configuration for the systems. Uh, FISMA is the Federal Information Security Management Act. It's intended as a successor to GISRA, which is the Government Information Security Reform Act, which was passed about two and a half years ago and has a sunset provision. It's due to expire this year. Uh, both of these laws, uh, the primary provision is to require federal agencies to file uh, statements of their security posture and their, uh, their uh, incidents that they've had in the past year uh, with the, uh, I believe it's with the General Accounting Office, although I'm not, I wouldn't be certain of that, it might be OMB. Anyway, but they have to file with a central authority uh, within the federal government to uh, make sure that they're doing the right things. Uh, FISMA actually just passed the House um, as, an, uh, as an amendment to uh, H.R. 5005, which was the uh, authorization bill for the new Department of Homeland Defense. Uh, and DMCA and the Patriot Act, the Patriot Act, is, the, both of these have been covered in other presentations this weekend or will be covered uh, later on today, so I don't want to go into uh, any more detail with you. I did hear this morning, by the way, uh, that the uh, complaint that HP had filed against, their, uh, 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 against Snowsoft uh, has been withdrawn. Uh, that they didn't actually they didn't actually get to a, full, a formal complaint with law enforcement anyway, but they've they've sort of withdrawn their threatening letter that they sent. Uh, and there's there is an interesting legal debate I think as to as to to what extent and how uh, DMCA applies to security research <coughs> uh, and <coughs> and the reverse engineering of non copyright mechanisms. <coughs> okay, I went really fast through that. That's good. I've done this presentation a couple other times, and usually it takes me about 50 minutes to get to that far. So I'm going to try to get through this pretty quickly. Uh, the rest, there's a couple more slides here, and then uh, hopefully we can have some questions. So trends. Uh, increasing legislation, clearly, just on the, on the previous slide, there are a bunch of things in there. Uh, I suspect that we will probably be seeing more. Uh, the primary thrust of a lot of the legislation, actually, is to uh, improve the definitions of cybercrime, to keep thing, make sure that things are up to date, that the laws are actually reflecting current technology. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see whether or not they manage to get it right. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, legislators aren't exactly tech savvy for the most part. Uh, we'll see more, uh, more and improving communication channels, largely in the form, uh, at least in, in private industry, of the ISACs. Uh, we'll probably see increasing attempts, at least, to improve communication between private industry and public sector. Uh, whether or not those will play out, I think, is uh, uh, unlikely, or I think, it, I think it's unlikely that those will be particularly successful, uh, at least in the short term. 
Uh, we'll see more and more research being done, more and more software being put out there that has uh, security flaws. Um, uh, the uh, uh, vulnerability rate, the, the rate of new vulnerabilities being announced has been increasing at approximately 90% per year since 1992. Shows no signs of abating, uh, and uh, which puts us on target for about, we're expecting on the order of 2,000 new vulnerabilities to be announced in 2002, uh, and we'll expect about 4,000 in uh, 2003. That'll be fun. <clears throat> I think we'll probably see more uh, vicious attacks. We've seen the, the attacks getting more aggressive and more automated. So they're going faster uh, and being uh, uh, more complex in terms of multi, uh, being multi-prong or multi-vector in their attacks. We'll probably see more multi-platform worms uh, and more uh, multiple vulnerability worms coming along. Uh, and I think we'll probably start to see stuff uh, uh, maybe not by the end of this year, but perhaps next year, uh, that is more destructive than what we've seen in the past in terms of the mass, the mass, uh, worm, the mass attack worms. Uh, uh, NIMDA, for example, was sort of our poster child, uh, and uh, the, it, it was very expensive to clean up because it would scribble all over the system, but, but the damage wasn't really, it didn't really destroy anything or not much in the course of doing these things. So it, uh, it, it, in terms of damage, it didn't do that much, but it was still very expensive. Uh, and uh, the continuing penetration of internet access will, will have an effect on this. It'll, it'll continue to raise the profile of information security with the public uh, and uh, in the press, which or, or I, perhaps I should say in the press and subsequently in the public. Uh, here are some uh, wild ass guesses for you. Uh, will the public demand security? Probably not. Uh, there's no sign that they have in the past, there's definitely no sign that they will, um, except uh, insofar as they, 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 re they may demand security in the context of privacy. That's possible. Uh, we've seen legislation, of course, with uh, GLBA and HIPAA uh, that create privacy standards for financial information and, and healthcare information, respectively. Uh, and the public seems to like that kind of stuff. We may see more of that relating to more kinds of information, uh, perhaps even e-commerce uh, coming along at some point, uh, where uh, there will be regulations dictating uh, what kinds of privacy practices and, and the corresponding security practices you need to have in place if you take a credit card online, for example. Uh, that's an interesting idea. Well, I don't think we're going to see that in, in the next, uh, within the next three years, though. Uh, who will pay for security, I think, is a very interesting question. Consumers do not appear to be willing to pay for security. Uh, they certainly don't make the uh, uh, more secure choices in operating systems or software that they purchase, uh, including corporations, by and large. Uh, there are cer certainly a few notable exceptions. Interestingly, they will pay for security devices. They will pay for software and hardware that will help them improve their security, that, that will do their security, uh, that will do security things for them. Uh, but uh, you'd be hard pressed, I think, to give examples of uh, where people will actually buy, take the more secure software choice. You, you want to address that? How do they know which ones are more secure? Yeah. Uh, this is a question, actually. Uh, did you ask that the, uh, the other day, too? Somebody else asked me the same question, and I gave this at Black Hat. Um, uh, how do they know which one is more secure? Uh, and that's an interesting question. Um, and uh, by and large, they don't, of course. Uh, because there's no there's no easy way to do that, uh, but they don't they don't have to know which is more which is more secure factually, right? All they really have to know is which one is marketing something as being more secure. Because as we all know, technology doesn't drive the decisions; marketing drives the decisions. Somebody I'm sure is going to raise their hand on that one. But anyway, the, uh, yeah, the, if the, there are cases where uh, software vendors have essentially advertised this is the secure stuff, right? And it does not drive software sales. Okay. Uh, we can, well, that, that's a more extensive discussion than I, we have time for right now. We can talk about it afterwards if you want. Uh, there is some indication, by the way, that the government may step in here. Uh, it, it's very vague at this point, and I think it's highly unlikely, but it is possible that the government will help subsidize secure software engineering practices at software vendors, which is a very interesting idea. Um, I don't know if it's going to happen. I think probably not, uh, but there's, there are some rumblings around Washington on this. Uh, I, I didn't delete this from Thursday, so the, uh, the lessons from recent events, the HP DMCA threat. Uh, for those of you who don't know, by the way, uh, a, uh, a vulnerability was published in True64, the, the Unix operating system that came through comp the compact acquisition, um, and uh, HP's response was rather than to fix it, to send a threatening letter saying you may be subject to five years imprisonment and a $500,000 fine, uh, which generated for them a ton of bad press. Uh, 
creating a story where there wouldn't otherwise have been a story, uh, except in the, I mean, the security community, of course, would have all said, oh, HP, they suck, they didn't fix their thing, uh, but nobody else would have cared. And uh, instead, we got mainstream press coverage over the issue for threatening the, the security researchers. Uh, but it's an interesting idea that, that this is, it was an interesting contrast for this to come the day before Richard Clark stood up in front of Black Hat and essentially told the assembled throng that it was everyone's moral obligation to go find vulnerabilities in software. It's an interesting contrast with that and the possible provisions with DMCA. I am not a lawyer. Uh, there are our lawyers here, I'm sure, who will address this in more detail. <clears throat> uh, everyone uh, asks me when I talk about this stuff about liability laws and, and how that will affect uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the security of software, whether software vendors will be held liable, whether we'll have to give up our exemption for product safety and so forth. Uh, I don't see it changing anytime soon. I think it will change eventually, uh, but probably not for a long time. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. Primarily the academic growth of the last 15 years, uh, if you look at it, was primarily driven by increases in productivity that were generated by improvements in information technology. The extremely rapid rate of innovation uh, it was, uh, was largely responsible for uh, the economic growth that we've seen and continue to see in, in a, just at a smaller rate. Uh, and uh, the, the case is made rather strongly, if not necessarily particularly factually, that the increasing the liability laws would reduce the rate of innovation to the point where uh, information technology would no longer be able to be an engine of growth within the economy and no politician in the world wants to do that. Okay. And Lots of people in the public don't really want their politicians to do that either, we should point out. Okay. So just to uh, wrap stuff up, I don't think there are any major changes on the horizon. I think that we are uh, drifting in the general direction of more secure software. The state of the art of software engineering is improving. We are seeing people take security more seriously, particularly at major software vendors, not to name any names. Uh, and uh, But I think that that progress in the improvement of the security is largely offset by the increasing complexity of the software. There's more stuff out there. The, the, th the stuff that is out there is far more complex than it was. Uh, and that as you know, I don't think anyone would dispute that, that uh, complexity is the antithesis of security. Uh, and that's what, uh, that's what accounts for the continuing growth that we're seeing. We are improving the, uh, the software engineering, but it doesn't really matter in the big scheme of things because, it's, because we're, making it, uh, we're making other things worse. Uh, so uh, we've got time for, for questions. Yeah. Yeah, uh, pointing out um, a, a potential omission in my slides of uh, the uh, funding of research uh, by the selling of exploits uh, and the selling of vulnerability information. Um, the and, and I think it's a good point, although I think it's a it, I think it's not a significant um, uh, it's not a significant in the overall picture right now. Uh, there have been a couple of examples of places where people have tried to do that. Uh, in most cases, those have really been considered more blackmail than business. Uh, that that the and most of the cases have really been sort of extortive in the, in their nature. Right? Somebody calls up the company and says, you know, I found out a flaw on your website. I downloaded. All, there have been a couple of cases of this. Down, I downloaded all your credit card, all your customer credit card information, and uh, you know, pay me money or I'm going to publish it and make you guys look bad. Uh, that uh, that we we have definitely seen. I, I have, we haven't seen anybody yet. Make a make a legitimate business out of that, except in so far as uh, they're doing the research on a contract basis, evaluating the, evaluating the software. And you can you can sort of if you want to sort of spin it that way, you can say that you know, they're not being paid to do the research; they're being paid to supply the vulnerability, right? But I mean, the, generally, the consumer of that, the customer of that, is is using the is using it to lever uh, the vendor to improve the software, right? Uh, so uh, I see. I, I understand your point. I think it's a, a, a minor concern, uh, and I don't think we're going to see a, gr a growth in that at all over in the future. Uh, let me going to get a couple other people to follow up after. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the question is, how do you get into an ISAC? Uh, and I, uh, I am not an expert on ISACs. I don't actually know. Um, the, uh, uh, there are probably folks here who can answer that question better than I, than I can. But if you're in an industry that has one, uh, do a web search, find out where they are. They probably have a website or something, something you can contact. Um, the, the office that coordinates them is um, 
I think the Critical Infrastructure Assurance Office out of Commerce, uh, and they could probably point you in the right direction too. I think it's Chow who does it. Yeah. Everybody back here, that could you guys, no, you didn't hear it. The uh, the, uh, the 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 comment was that I should rather than use I'm use, generally using security vulnerability as a as to refer to the entities within the software that that are at issue here. Uh, the gentleman was was uh, suggesting that that using the term product defect uh, was a better term and was probably more and was more factually accurate. Right, uh, that what we're talking about here really is. Uh, not flaws in software, uh, but defects in consumer products, just like uh, the stuff that we saw recently with the Ford Firestone, right, the tires being failing and so forth. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's, a good, it's a good point. Uh, that certainly is a, is a debate. Uh, one of the reasons I didn't do that, though, um, is that I think it's a different debate than the one that I'm, the one that I'm discussing here. Uh, that it is, uh, is a particular uh, political strategy to go and attempt to uh, uh, rectify the problems that I've been, that we've been talking about here uh, through the, essentially the use of uh, uh, product liability laws. I, I sort of alluded to that briefly at the end. Uh, and uh, that's, that's a, a great, I think, um, uh, tactic. Uh, it's a good, and, and the, uh, the overall is, is a good, you know, it's a good, good thing to be doing to be trying to accomplish something. Uh, I specifically actually avoided that because I don't want to be advocating that point of view necessarily. Uh, the, the, my, my purpose here was really to sort of lay, lay out the, the realm more than to more than to advocate a particular point of view and, and I tried uh, with mixed success to avoid things like product defect that are somewhat inflammatory in, in their in their usage for for this kind of talk so but it's a, it's a great point uh, yes gentlemen up uh, here right Yeah. I think I think that's probably the only way that we will see it. The comment was that that uh, uh, consumers never demanded seatbelts in airbags in cars, right? Public research groups uh, made the uh, demands of government, lobbied government. Government made the laws that required the manufacturers to provide the safety equipment within the automobiles, and then the consumer, of course, ends up paying for it in the in the purchase of the in the purchase of the vehicle. Uh, and the question is, do I see that happening in uh, in software? And the answer, not anytime soon. Uh, I think in, I think we're looking in the probably five to fifteen year time frame before we get there. Keep in mind, automobiles were shipping were were, were being purchased without seatbelts for at least fifty years uh, before the before any of this stuff happened, right? And I, there's an analogy with with the automobile, which I think is not good. Right? Uh, and I, I got to wrap up after this one. I apologize for the questions I didn't get to. We can we can take them. I, I can take them afterwards. Uh, the uh, for, there are two. There are two major things there. First off, uh, is the physical safety of, of the user. Right? Uh, there are. I, I think we would be hard pressed to produce an example of someone being injured by their computer crashing. 
Okay. Now, there, with their uh, specific use uh, computers that where that may be exceptions to that, where they're in the car or something like that, where it's part of another device that is involved in, in personal safety. But for a PC you know, or a desktop workstation or even a file server at a corporation, right, the, the crash is not putting somebody in jeopardy. Now, again, there are specific examples where that's not true, whether it's a control system for a nuclear power plant or uh, information that's being used in, uh, uh, for surgery or something like that. Uh, and those are, those are different examples, I think, than, than, than the, the bulk of what we're talking about in the consumer market, right? So that's, uh, the analogy, I think, breaks down a little bit there. But I think all, and the other thing is the, um, the last point for the, for the talk is that the, the science of mechanical engineering is far older than the science of software engineering. Uh, we've, we've been around, it's been around for a long, 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 long time uh, prior to uh, the automobile being the applications that were used in the automobile. We understood what we needed to do in order to make people safe. It's not clear to me that we understand what to do in order to make software secure. Okay, uh, that'll have to be it. Uh, we're out of time. Thanks everybody for uh, coming around. Great questions.